Hello, this is Jim Hogue, and this is the House of Pooh Corner, and this is the second broadcast at Orca. I think we have a very exciting story today. It's a story uh, about those people who cover up the truth and those people who seek the truth. And I find that one of my favorite themes. And uh, it's also a story of gatekeeper, gatekeepers and those who open the gates. It's about a 70-year-old story. It's had its moments of, of being exposed openly, debated openly, reported openly. Kennedy talked about the wonderful possibilities of geoengineering for agriculture. And President Johnson talked about the possibilities of geoengineering as a military weapon to keep the United States safe from the evildoers. And um, if, you, if you go back far enough, which is what we're going to be doing today with Ian Baldwin, uh, you will see how the story gradually became um, muddied and eventually covered up. And Ian will tell us how that happened and why. Uh, Ian is the publisher emeritus of Chelsea Green. He founded Chelsea Green. And he has written nine articles on the subject that we are going to be talking about today from a purely scientific and historical and factual point of view. So we're looking forward to hearing that. And um, I guess that's all I need. Oh, I did want to mention Cynthia Johnson, who put me onto geoengineering uh, many years ago. And when I had my radio program, I interviewed the visionaries who were covering the topic. And they went, they didn't uh, pussyfoot around. They went right to chemtrails and explained what the chemtrails were. And we have one of uh, Ilana Freeland's books here, Chemtrails, Harp, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. And she has another book called Under an Ionized Sky. So that's second half. We're going to be doing two programs. And the first half will be more introductory. And the second half might get into the nitty gritty of what's up there in the sky now. So uh, Ian Baldwin, tell us whatever you think we ought to know in the way of introduction. And we'll go from there. OK, Jim. Uh, one small correction. I co-founded Chelsea Green with my wife, Margo. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we both started it in 1984. And um, yes, I, uh, I got interested in this subject because uh, a, a mutual friend, John Ford, mm -hmm. in 2005, tried to tell me about chemtrails. And I had enough on my plate, 9-11, other things. And I felt this is overload, stimulation overload. So I held up my hand and said, no, I don't want to hear about it. Then a year later, I had to get up one mid warm mid-October night. Uh, uh, I think that was actually 2005, uh, and, and John tried to talk to me in 2004, um, and saw a vast trail in the sky, night sky. It was a full moon, so it was illuminated. It was as far as I could see to the east and to the west, so many miles long, and seriously big and nothing else. So I was dumbfounded, frankly. I mean, I was really dumbfounded. And uh, I, do, I do remember saying to myself, I think I said it out loud even, uh, my God, John was right. But I also thought, waking up the next day, what can I, what's this, I, I, am I gonna, go down that rabbit hole, and I decided not to. 
Uh, but I, I've always been an observer of the, the realm above us, and uh, so I just paid more attention. And over the years, I began to see more and more evidence of things that clearly weren't contrails, except in, if you go into a, a room filled with liars, you can maybe be persuaded. But uh, uh, so I, I finally found myself a decade later in 2015, uh, really frustrated. I guess I had visited a couple of sites like Dane, Dane Wigington's site, and you've interviewed Dane, um, and realized that, oh, we're, the, the discussion is in a ghetto. It's ghettoized in, the, uh, in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And it's not touched by academics, by environmentalists, and of course by media, major print media, New York Times, Washington Post, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, I realized real progress couldn't happen on this issue because, for lack of a better term, the establishment had a solid front. Anything you see up there that is strange isn't in fact an illusion or a hallucination it's just normal contrails, and keep it under advisement. And normal traffic. And normal traffic. So uh, I, I got introduced through a mutual friend, uh, Lynn Margulis. Her son, Dorian Sagan, uh, said, well, Ian, I, I know a scientist who is also pretty excited about this. Besides pretty my father. <laughs> Carl Sagan. <laughs> yeah, Carl was his father. Mm -hmm. uh, both parents were deceased when this happened. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I called Marvin. We had a very long conversation. We decided to, uh, uh, because he lived in San Diego, and the air there does not permit anything but a very rare contrail because it's dry, mm -hmm. and uh, Marvin could tell they weren't flying up at 35, 40,000. They were flying lower down, and uh, none of the scientific criteria were met for contrails. And the skies were getting whitened. The blue skies, the traditional, normal, San Diego blue skies, were no longer blue. They were getting milky at the end of a day's operations. Mm -hmm. So he was, being a chemist, among other things, uh, he was furious because what goes up must come down. And uh, if it's metals, uh, good chance they're hazardous. Uh, so we got talking and said, well, let's at least try to broach this issue, get it out for discussion. Uh, and I had various leads to, oh, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, and worked those so that this little op-ed, seven, eight hundred words, could be considered got nowhere, stonewalled, didn't even get a response. And there, there he was, a published mm -hmm. nuclear chemist, geoscientist, and myself, a publisher, not even the courtesy of a, re a reply. Mm -hmm. So then we understood, okay, it ain't up for discussion outside of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean the ghetto as a pejorative term. No, I understand. You mean yeah, a dictionary yeah. definition of the ghetto. Yeah. 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 And so I, we agreed. Mm -hmm. Forensic scientific research had to be done. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people were there before us. In fact, the story goes back as a, my most recent piece for Vermont Independent. 
traces it to 1997-8, when the first serious reporter covered it for Environmental News Service. Mm -hmm. And so we're late coming into this game. Yeah. And, uh, but we're the first people, or I should say Marvin is the first person who is doing actual hands-on research. Mm -hmm. What did this entail? This entailed collecting rainwater from me, snow water, from other people, snow water. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were already existing databases of, of rainwater. In that early period of spring of 2015, Wigington and I and Herndon all watched very interesting video. And it showed coal fly ash being taken away in trains. And the videographer, who I don't think ever identified himself, it was a male, said, guess where this is going. Ah. So a light bulb went up, because all of us were wondering, uh, including Dane, who'd been in the game for six or seven years, what is it they're spraying, and what's the evidence for it? Mm -hmm. Can you clarify the term coal fly ash? Okay. Coal burned in, I think it's hundreds or thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, gives off a microscopically small ash particle mm -hmm. Debris. The, the Indians are still sending it up into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. The Chinese, I think, are still sending it up, although I, I think they're also trying to come to terms with it. Mm -hmm. Very, very, because as an environmentalist in the 70s, I remember fighting for scrubbers. They were called mm -hmm. scrubbers, yes. putting in the stacks. Mm -hmm. So, electrostatic stacks. So that these microscopic particles couldn't escape into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now in the United States and Europe, that's the case. So they're, they're trapped as a waste stream, a huge mm -hmm. waste stream. I mean, seriously big, okay? Actually, it's <coughs> used for a number of commercial products. It's used for cement, for roads, it's used for agriculture as some kind of a fertilizer. I haven't really figured out how it becomes a fertilizer. But, and, and so it has a number of different uh, quote unquote legal legitimate uses. Mm -hmm. um, Marvin found some scientific work done in Spain studying coal fly ash in Europe. And when it goes into the atmosphere, the atmosphere is loaded with rivers of moisture, far vaster than the Amazon, hmm. okay? So they interact, they coalesce, the, the water molecules, the H2O, around these nanoparticulates and form clouds and rain. In fact, you can manage the clouds, you can attenuate their rainfall and send them further down and let them drop it in, in dumps later on. What an idea. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also uh, ca cause drought. Mm -hmm. That's, we haven't gotten there yet. Right. So uh, Marvin decided to, uh, on the basis of this Spanish scientific work, which identified, I think, 33 elements that leached out when coal fly ash precipitated, okay? Mm -hmm. Collect the water and then test it. And you had a lot of bad hombres in there. You had aluminum, you had arsenic, you had mercury, you have radionuclides, barium, 
many, a few, only a few of which had been tested by people in the geoengineering resistance movement, the ghettoized movement. Shame on them. They found mm -hmm. unusual levels of aluminum mm -hmm. and barium. Those were the two primary mm -hmm. candidates, and sometimes strontium. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Marvin then found, whoa, that's not all, and added about seven other elements. Mm -hmm. You have to get a fairly sophisticated lab to get up to 30 plus. Mm -hmm. And those labs are run by universities for the most part. But commercial labs can do up to a certain number. Mm -hmm. And he took that and wrote a paper for a journal he had written for before, so they knew him, mm -hmm. called Current <coughs> Science which is the journal of the Indian Academy of Sciences in India. Hmm. And they, he published the first geoengineering paper. Now, the editor was hit on. We know that. They tried to get him to rescind the paper. And what was the date? Uh, June of 2015, I 15. believe. Okay. Yeah. Then Marvin decided to Dr. Herndon decided to, let's get this to the health care medical public. And he got it accepted. Everything is peer reviewed that he does. Mm -hmm. This is a man who's published numerous papers in the Royal Academy of Science in London, the proceedings of the National Academy in mm -hmm. Washington. And He's not a slouch. So the gatekeepers can ignore him, but they can't attack what he's written. Exactly. Okay. But you can be one in 14,000 scientific papers that have been peer reviewed are in fact retracted. Mm -hmm. uh, usually because someone has discovered uh, false data, mm -hmm. some kind of sh shenanigans. Yeah. Uh, Herndon had been publishing for roughly 40 years and never had anything retracted. Most scientists don't. Um, so he got it published. I've forgotten the name of the journal, but it was a public health Western-based journal. And within three weeks, the editor res retracted the paper. Hmm. Now, interestingly, the man who visited the editor face to face took the trouble to just show up on his doorstep and interview him, then made the mistake, I think, of boasting about it on Facebook. And the next paper I do for the Vermont Independent will have that boast on Facebook in it. Number 10. Number 10, yeah, the 10th page, yeah. So, uh, it turns out the man who did this, a man named Jay Reynolds, had an earlier track record getting Environmental News Service, uh, or I shouldn't say getting, uh, because they claim they did it on their own recognizance, but he spoke to them in very harsh terms. Hey. Apologize to your readers for publishing Will Thomas's stories about chemtrails. Now, Will Thomas never used the word chemtrails. You just changed yes. main characters here. I did. I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. I, I went back. Yeah, you went I went back, back 20 years because this mm -hmm. guy, this disinformation agent, mm -hmm. is still at work mm -hmm. on the subject. 20 years, uh, uh, not 20, close to 20 years, 15 years later. Mm -hmm. Now, why does he show up? He doesn't show up if you stay in the ghetto. It's when you get out of the ghetto mm -hmm. and you go to an environmental news service, mm -hmm. two or three years later, Earth Island Journal, mm -hmm. it can't be tolerated mm -hmm. because it could creep into the mainstream from there. Mm -hmm. So it's news management. Yes. Okay. By a paid 
lobbyist. Of oh, he may not even be paid. If you've read about the CIA and understand how it functions, mm -hmm. there is no formula. People volunteer. That's yeah, true. People volunteer. Yeah. Okay, they're patriotic citizens. Mm -hmm. They believe in the mission. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in uh, so, Marvin fought back. Marvin's a fighter. Mm -hmm. He's not just a scientist. He's Marvin a fighter. Herndon. Herndon. Mm -hmm. And but he, they held. They held firm. Mm -hmm. uh, there was nothing wrong with the paper. It's just that he was touching on a forbidden subject that in, officially had no val validity or proof, mm -hmm. despite what Marvin said, which is, there is very good evidence, mm -hmm. it's called fly ash. Yeah. Uh-uh, uh, not talkable. That interests me because I've never heard anybody argue the point about it, because as you said, Many, many years ago, the environmentalists all lined up for scrubbers in the coal plants. So where are they now? If they were fighting for it then, where well, are they Jim, now? Jim, think about if you're, a, if you're in a street fight. Uh, now, I worked in the environmental movement in the early 70s. Yes, yeah, so Chelsea Green was the leader. It wasn't around in, 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 in the early 70s. I mean, when it, when it, when it went when, yeah, later. Yeah. So uh, it, in the early 70s, really smart lawyers mm -hmm. who were idealists signed up. When we fought for the Marine Mammal Protection Act, Bill Butler, the EDF lawyer, mm -hmm. stood up against 30 lawyers. Mm -hmm and won. But the war was being lost. Mm -hmm. Battles were won, mm -hmm. but the war was being lost right on up to the present moment. Mm -hmm. That leads into a whole different discussion, which some Next we'll half, do. when we, uh, oh, we've got, okay, we've only got five <laughs> yeah, minutes left. Time flies. And the next program, which will be coming up shortly, yeah. we'll talk about that. Okay. Anyway, um, you, you're going to have to help me reconnect here because I, we, okay. we've strayed over a couple of points. Yes, uh, the, the Marvin Herndon uh, expertise has been ignored and the wonderful research by Wilson, did you say, the other guy? Uh, uh, no, he wasn't a researcher. He was a dead-on reporter. And his well, name his name was William Thomas. William Thomas, I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. Yeah. So those two are the, the main characters in the story of the suppression of incontrovertible information. I information, not not proof. Mm -hmm. Information. And um, yeah, Marvin got he is also besieged by someone at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, mm -hmm. Zegili or someone, who comes out of nowhere. Oh, I remember him. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't he one of the 9-11 the uh, Oh, he could have been. Deniers? He could have been, Jim. There was an, a famous Italian who made it. No, this guy is a, a Hungarian. Hungarian. Okay. Na anyway. And at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Okay. And he shows up out of nowhere. Uh, Marvin, having had 40 years of publishing scientific papers, some of which were highly original, got his second and third paper on this subject retracted. Statistically, impossible. Mm -hmm. Politically, possible. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point, because the, the third paper was also a medical paper, also published in the West. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I've forgotten the journal, uh, but it's environmental medicine, broadly speaking. Mm -hmm. So at that point, we gathered together around the Skype campfire and agreed, can't pursue this subject in Western journals. Must find non-Western science journals. Hmm. So we have, he has been publishing since then in mainly Indian, not exclusively, mm -hmm. journals. There, 
they operate under the same rigors as a U.S. drug. Yeah. But they're not located in the U.S., mm -hmm. and they're not subject to the political pressures, spoken or unspoken, that are exerted on scientific journals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, since then, we have published, I, I was a co-author on one, he, he picked up a, a, uh, a doctor, an MD, who actually works for the government, who has co-authored the medical aspects of using coal fly ash mm -hmm. as an aerosol to do a, a variety of purposes. We, we, we should get into the purposes at yes, some point. We will do that. Yeah. So uh, one of them, in case those of you missed the second half, is that it actually warms the planet. It that's the that's the net effect, and we that's the net effect, and and that should be subject of the next. Part yeah, of the next it's, it's too segment. complicated to start it is, now, but yeah. we'll do that in the, the next half hour. Good. Anyway, um, uh, we've now got 15 or 16 published and non-retracted, peer-reviewed scientific papers. The best repression is silence. Mm -hmm. It's much the best. So far, in Western media, I'm, I'm talking mainstream media. Well, also in, Amy Goodman and that, that crowd. I include, uh, she's yeah. in that. She's it, mainstream media. Yeah, she's yeah. mainstream media. Yeah. Western media, Western academia, Western environmentalists, mm -hmm. and of course politicians. Well, that goes without saying completely mm -hmm. verboten to even talk about the possibility. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to who is your adversary? You asked, who was the adversary back in the 70s and even 80s? Well, it, it might have been McDonald's or it might have been Union Carbide. The, the adversary now is called the Pentagon. Ah, okay. Because they need it. Well, we have to uh, wind this up. Your guest has been Ian Baldwin, uh, publisher emeritus of Chelsea Green, who, which built its reputation on environmental literature. Environmental and agricultural and food and yeah, yeah healthy so living. Here we are at home, home Plate with one of the leaders in the movement. And thank you for watching. And we'll see you in the next half hour.